Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I hope all of you are safe and sound. My name is Numan Mane. I'm a petroleum engineer, currently working as a field engineer with Halliburton, Iraq, and I will be your moderator for today's session. On behalf of Arab Oil and Gas Academy, I would like to welcome you all to the second webinar of Gas Dehydration, given by a remarkable guest speaker, Dr. Abdelaziz Khulaifat. Our guest speaker is a petroleum engineer with more than 23 years of experience. He had both his PhD and master's degree in chemical engineering from Illinois Institute of Technology, USA. Currently, he's a professor of petroleum engineering at the American University in Cairo. Prior to that, he was a professor of ener energy engineering at the American University of Iraq. Previously, he had taken many roles at different academic institutions, such as an instructor, assistant professor, associate professor, and a professor and had held some adjunct positions such as prominent head of petroleum engineering at Abu Dhabi, chairman of chemical engineering, and many others. Industry-wise, he had held the position of a senior reservoir engineer and a manager for Weatherford Research Center located at Saudi Arabia. He also was the founder and co-founder of different academic departments and research centers, and authored and co-authored 91 publications on various topics including journal articles and book chapters in the areas of flow-through porous media, hydrocarbon reservoir engineering, con unconventional tight and shale gas, and others. He is an active SPE member and rewarded several technical and academic awards and was listed among notable alumni at 2017. Before we begin, let me remind you to leave your questions in the Q&A box down below. Now, please help me to welcome Dr. Khulaifat. Dr. Khulaifat? It's a pleasure having you here with us again today, and the mic is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Loma, for this uh, nice introduction, and hello, everyone. So today we will keep talking about uh, gas dehydration, the topic we started a week ago, if you remember last week. And today uh, we will cover the remaining outcomes as shown in this slide. So by the end of today's session, you will be able to understand the glycol dehydration process. And uh, we will have a design example where you should be able to calculate the glycol absorber diameter and height. And we will wrap up today's session by talking about solid bed dehydration where you will understand how solid bed dehydration process is carried out. So, to uh, summarize the classification of dehydration uh, processes or natural gas dehydration processes, we have to remove wa water vapor uh, from the gaseous stream, and this can be done using different methods or different techniques. The first one shown here is uh, absorption, where uh, water vapor is absorbed by a solvent or carried away by a solvent. And the best chemicals used for this purpose are glycols and different glycols exist uh, in the market and can be utilized, such as uh, monoethylene glycol, diethylene glycol, and triethylene glycol. The next method actually is called adsorption. So where the water vapor gets adsorbed by solid particles. And uh, this is a physical process while the first one is uh, chemical. And there are different, different uh, adsorbents or uh, desiccants uh, used for this purpose, such as alumina, molecular sieves, silica gel, calcium chlorides, and others. The third method, guys, used for this purpose is condensation, where we condensate the water vapor by reduction in temperature. And this can be done by a, a turbo expansion or expansion valves. As you know, gas, when it gets expanded, it cools down. And this process is carried out at adiabatic condition where the transfer of heat between the system and its surrounding is uh, zero. 
and the other method by uh, refrigeration or external uh, physical cooling process. And the last one, guys, we covered last time where we inhibit or uh, depress the uh, dew point of uh, hydrate formation. And we did talk a lot about it last time where we covered glycol and methanol injection. Today, uh, we will focus mainly in on the first process, which is absorption. And we will touch base with respect to the second process, adsorption. And we will talk about the physical concepts and how does it work. Well, uh, as I mentioned, guys, uh, absorption is nothing but a liquid taken away by another liquid or another chemical. So the chemical that carries away a liquid is called a uh, hygroscopic fluid or uh, the fluid that attracts another liquid. And for this purpose, we said the glycols are the best utilized for this purpose. And among glycols, actually, it was determined that uh, triethylene glycol is the best. Why? We will see this throughout the lecture. It works very well for operating conditions of low temperature and high pressure. If we link this with what, with what have been covered last week, so these are the favorable conditions for glyco, for uh, hydrates to get formed. And this was determined by a combination of two laws, Raoult's law and Dalton law, to give us equal equilibrium constant K sub I, which is nothing but the ratio between partial pressure to total pressure of a system or vapor pressure to total pressure, which is equal, and equal to a mole fraction uh, uh, in the vapor phase of i component divided by the mole fraction of i component in the liquid phase. And it's good actually to uh, decrease equal equilibrium constant to shift the dew point down and as per this equation, guys, uh, to decrease equal equilibrium constant, we have to reduce the amount of uh, water vapor in the vapor phase, Y sub I. And this can be done by decreasing the partial pressure or the water vapor pressure in the system. It is a must and necessary conditions for this process to work very well to have either constants or uh, increasing pressure. So if we increase the total pressure of the system, then the share of the partial pressure of water eventually will be less. Well, uh, uh, the process itself or absorption process is not a patch one which means uh, we cannot just add them and mix them in a closed system. I mean, glycol and the wet gas. It has to be a continuous process because of the continuous flow of uh, gas from uh, gas wells or from the reservoir. Uh, and in order to have it visible, so the process has to be uh, continuous. And reaching equilibrium is a must actually for uh, the carryover of water vapor by the glycol. It was determined that the best way to do the process is by having it as a counter current flow process, which means when gas is going up, a glycol has to go down. And as it becomes in contact with the wet gas, eventually glycol forces or it carries over or it attracts water vapor and carries it over down by gravity and pressure drop. And there are two actually uh, columns used for this purpose. The first one is called a tray column or stage-wise operations where equal equilibrium concept, concept is achieved or attained. And the other one is back column or continuous contact operation with different plates. And this is called rate concept. 
regardless the type of the column, so the operation in terms of physical units is the same. But uh, definitely the first one uh, performs better and gives better efficiency. Now, if we look at the flow diagram of the process, uh, guys, uh, that's what you have <laughs> or what you can see in, in this slide. It consists of different unit. The main unit is shown actually or denoted by one in the left hand side here, which is nothing, but let me uh, use annotation. So this is the absorber or the heart of the uh, process where absorption process takes place. So we will cover each unit in more details. Then uh, uh, the other unit is called flash drum. And you know that when we say flash, which means we remo remove something out of the system and we might decrease the pressure of the system. Another unit, which is a heat exchanger, and heat exchanger is used for two purposes, either to cool or to increase the temperature of one of the fluids. And then we have a stripping unit or stripper column. And we strip water or water vapor out. We will see more details. And we have a pump. Pump is usually used to increase the liquid pressure. You know this. And another heat exchanger actually in this side is uh, used to uh, uh, transfer heat between two different fluids. And at the inlet uh, in the lower corner here, we see a separator. You remember last week when we covered the example of uh, methanol injection, uh, where we have lot of condensate, it turned out the process was unvisible and uneconomical. And what we said, we said condensate has to be separated before treatment process. And that's what we do. So in case of uh, condensate content or high uh, water content, we have to get rid of this ahead of treatment or ahead of absorption, okay? Okay. So where the gas come from, we said it last week, it comes from different sources after being or after having the condensate and liquid large water amount separated, the wet gas eventually enters the column or the absorber from the bottom, while the lean, the lean glycol, which is clean glycol, enters from the top. And when they face each other, eventually glycol takes the water vapor down. And in the column, we have to have something that delays the movement of both fluids. And in here, uh, uh, trays are installed where the glycol hit a tray and flows over a tray and the gas or the wet gas along with the vapor goes up through holes in the trays. This prolongs the life of basically uh, the existence of both fluids in the absorber and increase the amount of heat or mass transfer in the absorber and definitely results in a better efficiency of uh, uh, water vapor removal. Then, from the bottom of the absorber, guys, the rich glycol leaves out. And we call it rich because it is highly saturated with water. And usually there are about six to eight tray trays in the column. Now when gas reaches the top of the column, uh, it has very low dew point, less than uh, minus eight degrees. And the glycol that comes back or refluxes back or recirculating back uh, 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 comes with a bit higher temperature. Then the leaving stream of uh, dry gas cools a glycol down because the glycol has to enter at a temperature which is 
uh, by 10 degrees higher than the inlet uh, wet gas temperature. Well, to understand the concept beta, uh, it's shown actually here, we will focus in the one in the right. So what do we have guys? We have a column that has many plates, okay, or trays. As you can see, the tray is designed in this way. So it does not occupy the whole cross-sectional area of the uh, column. And uh, each actually tray has many holes, but these holes, they have like valves that can open under uh, high pressure. Now, when the wet gas goes into the column, so basically it goes up through these holes, okay? And it mixes or it has heat mass transfer with the glycol that comes from uh, the top. So uh, gas eventually goes only through the plates, okay? All the way up and its journey eventually is prolonged or the residence time of gas or wet gas uh, is uh, longer. And now glycol goes over the plates and carries along with it the water vapor and goes this way, then this way. And basically it keeps going into different directions. And this is which makes its journey longer and then leaves the column to uh, um, report, okay? And what you can see in the top here, you can see the design of the plate uh, uh, caps or the plate valves. So from the bottom of the plate, uh, we have gas along with vapor. They go in and under the pressure. Eventually this cap goes up and opens. You can see a side view of uh, gas bubble going up up actually or rising up through the liquid glycol along with water. Well, uh, after leaving the absorber, rich glycol eventually leaves with very high pressure and we have to decrease the pressure for the sake of uh, uh, glycol regeneration. Now we cannot dump this uh, glycol away, we have to reactivate it or regenerate it, okay? What does this mean? We have to get the uh, water content in glycol and recycle glycol back to the absorber. So we're gonna use the same amount and we have to have uh, a regeneration process uh, in place for the sake of uh, visibility and of course, uh, to have a better economy of the process. So uh, uh, then we have to lower its pressure after leaving the absorber. And we use the flash drum here. And along with gas, sometimes uh, some hydrocarbons basically get uh, carried over and they can be released in this flash drum. Then the cold glycol has to pass through a heat exchanger where, uh, uh, where it is in content, but there is no direct contact between them. You know, heat exchanger concept, how does it work? Uh, encountered by a hot stream of lean glycol, which means clean glycol coming from the uh, reboiler and stripper. And then it goes or it keeps its journey to the stripper. Well, uh, in the stripper, eventually uh, uh, the temperature of the system or the mixture of glycol with water is uh, increased, okay? Uh, where water gets vaporized out of these two mixture of fluids, and then we concentrate our uh, uh, mixture to have pure glycol. Pure glycol or lean glycol then flows back and it is recycled again or reflux or recirculated again into the absorber. So we have a closed system when it comes to regeneration or use of a glycol. While with respect to a gas, gas flow, it's an open system and continuous flow system. Now we said it. Uh, absorber works at high pressure. Then in the root, we have to have a pump to increase 
recirculated glycol pressure to operating pressure. If the temperature of glycol is still high, then another heat exchanger can be added in the route to uh, lower the temperature. And the gas glycol heat exchanger, again, can add value in this respect. Well, what are the operating conditions? Two actually uh, operating conditions uh, we always worry about. One is pressure and the other one uh, is uh, temperature. Uh, it was determined that absorbers love to work at uh, uh, high pressure, okay? Uh, that can go up to 4,000 PSI. And in the meantime, uh, 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 a pressure of less than, less than 3,000 does not eventually influence the process a lot. Uh, increasing the pressure requires cost as well. And then it was determined uh, by industrial means that the best operating conditions for absorbers in, term, in terms of pressure is between 1,000 and 1,200 PSI. And this is a quite high pressure. Later, we will look at the pressure used in the stripper. So the pressure drop then will be significantly between them. So uh, uh, glycol regeneration takes at, uh, or takes place at a very low pressure that can go down to atmospheric pressure. You talk about 14.7. From 1,000 to 14.7 is a large drop eventually in pressure. And this drop in pressure is carried out again using the flash drum. Sometimes uh, actually regeneration of glycol takes place at vacuum pressure, but this will drive the coast up, so which is invisible. Well, with respect to uh, uh, temperature guys, uh, one thing we have to avoid we should avoid actually uh, um, injecting the gas into the absorber or uh, uh, pumping the gas if it has large amount of liquid into the absorber at uh, uh, high or at low temperature because low temperature might result in condensation of some fluid. How low the temperature uh, should be, we have to be careful with that as well because at a temperature of less, let's say less than 10 degrees Celsius, so eventually a glycol that comes in contact with the wet gas becomes very viscous. And this makes it so difficult for uh, highly viscous glycol to be uh, pumped. It can be pumped, but of course this will increase the cost and uh, will definitely uh, 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 depreciate the efficiency of the process. Now, if the temperature is between 16 and 21 degrees, so uh, a glycol eventually forms uh, some stable emulsion along with the hydrocarbons in the columns. And this might result in having a foam if foam is generated in the column, this is undesired because foam generation will carry over or will carry away lots of, lots of water molecules. And this definitely results in decreasing the efficiency of the process. Then what should we do? We have to choose a temperature that is uh, larger than 21 degrees Celsius, maybe 25, 27, 30 degrees are really good for uh, operating of the columns. Well, so the best then option or the best choice to have is to have uh, operating temperature of the columns to be between 27 and uh, 43 degrees as per industrial standards. What is the temperature drop between inlet and outlet gas stream? So uh, a practice dictates us this value to be almost 10 degrees Fahrenheit. So if the inlet temperature then is 80 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 27, then the outlet, or if the operating, I mean, 
then the uh, outlet eventually should be uh, uh, by 10 degrees uh, larger, which could go to 90, which is almost 32 point something, okay? Well, uh, what about the temperature of the uh, stripper? The temperature of the stripper should be high, definitely should be greater than 100 degrees. Why? Because water evaporates or boils at 100 degrees. It starts evaporating at less, but boils at 100. And uh, usually the uh, temperature in the stripper can be increased up to 390 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 199 degrees Celsius. So as twice as the boiling temperature of uh, water. And if we look at the used chemicals or solvent for this purpose, uh, we said we use triethanol glycol, it's boiling point 285, which is larger than 199, okay? Which means uh, there is no way to carry away along with the evaporated water to carry triethylene glycol or TEG. If we look at DEG, uh, mm, uh, diethylene glycol, the boiling point is 244. So still cannot be carried away. If we use uh, monoethylene glycol or MEG or EG, the boiling point is 197. Imagine having an operating condition of 200 degrees Celsius, and this will boil at 197. Then there is no lean glycol is coming back. The glycol will evaporate as well. So most of that glycol will be carried over along with the water vapor, okay? It's so important, guys, to know these concepts, so you, you decide in what to use. And this is the main reason actually to use triethylene glycol in addition to another reason uh, that it has a low vapor pressure compared to ethylene glycol, okay? Now, after treatment or after regeneration, eventually the water uh, content in the lean glycol is so low where the purity of lean glycol can go up to 98.9. We almost talk about 99% pure glycol, which means the rest is water. So water contents is almost 1.1%. Next, let's see how can we uh, design the column or absorber. Uh, uh, in here, we will talk mainly about two the properties of the columns or two parameters of the columns, mainly uh, diameter and uh, height. So to find the diameter, we start by uh, utilizing the Sauder brown correlation to calculate the maximum fluid velocity in the column, which is equal to uh, uh, the Sauder brown uh, coefficient that is constant and equal to 660, uh, multiplied by the square root of uh, a difference between two densities. Density of the gas, okay, in the denominator, and uh, you have it in the numerator subtracted from the density of the glycol. And this either given or found from different differences. Next. What we calculate, we calculate the cross-sectional area of the column. If we know the cross-sectional area of the column, then uh, it's quite easy. One can calculate the diameter of the column. How can we calculate this? Uh, if the flow rate of gas is given, volumetric flow rate, if we divide it, if it is given, and we divide it by the calculated in the previous slide maximum velocity or maximum superficial velocity of the gas, then we can find the area. While uh, uh, the gas that goes into the absorber eventually is a real gas because of higher pressure, then we use real gas equation of state to uh, calculate the volumetric flow rate, okay? Where again, we need to find number of moles, 
we need to find compressibility Z. R is universal gas constant that you don't have to worry about it. Temperature and pressure are always given because these are operating conditions for the process. Well, uh, one might ask, well, but how can we find in number of moles? Then guys, you need to go back to chemistry. Number of, go, uh, number of moles is nothing but the ratio between uh, uh, the mass of the gas flowing uh, divided by the molecular weight. Mass, if you have the volume and you have uh, the density, then you can calculate the mass. All these properties are eventually interrelated. Next, to calculate the Z factor or compressibility factor, different techniques exist. If the composition of the gas is given, then you can calculate the pseudocritical properties of the gas and you can use different charts. If not given, uh, then you have to find the specific gravity of the gas and based on that, you can use some charts and specific gravity can be calculated based on the given uh, density. You know that specific gravity of the gas is equal to uh, density of the gas divides by the density of air. Uh, if not given or you cannot find a chart, then you can go uh, uh, somewhere and find some easy correlations to uh, find Z as shown here. So Z can be calculated as a function of some reduced properties. And the, any reduced property is nothing but the given property divided by its critical uh, property. And that's what you see. Basically, Z can be calculated in this fashion where uh, we have just an involvement of different equations as a function of reduced properties. And after doing so, one can calculate uh, Z, okay? Uh, then, after finding the area, the, the diameter can be uh, calculated because a cross-sectional area of a circle is nothing but uh, pi r square or pi d square over four. And from that, you can calculate the diameter. The second part of the design, guys, is to find the column height, okay, which is a, a little bit more tricky because we have to use the so-called maccabi thyle method or maccabi uh, figure. And this figure basically shows the ratio between uh, mole fraction in the vapor phase as a function of mole fraction in the liquid phase. Mole fraction in the liquid phase, which means the weight of or weight percent of glycol, right? Okay. And of course, this done. This is usually done by uh, Maccab Maccabi and Thyle concepts. Uh, to have two operating curves or two curves or two lines. One is called equal equilibrium line. And for our case, as you can see, the equal equilibrium line is linear. And the other one is actually called operating line that could be uh, linear as well. Now, uh, in the columns, as you saw, guys, we have different trays and we said we always have from six to eight trays. It could be more based on the conditions. Uh, as you saw, these trays, they have holes. Not the whole tray is available for the flow, which means uh, each tray has its efficiency. And usually they assume that only 25% of the tray is available for the upward flow of wet gas. And uh, we assume that the efficiency is 25%. If we calculate the actual number of trays and the distance between trays is always assumed to be two feet, okay? Then one can calculate eventually the height. The height is number of trays multiplied by the spacing between them, which is two feet and efficiency of each tray, which is eta here. 25%, and by doing so, we can calculate the height. Then the challenge is to find N, and we need to find the actual number of plate using Maccabi-style uh, figure. 
shown in here. And in this figure, guys, you see a relationship between gas water content. It's in uh, bound mass H2O per million standard cubic feet. And of course, denoted by Y. And in X axis, we have weight percent of TEG, triethylene glycol, which is X, okay? And the lower curve or the upper curve here, the upper line is said to be operating line. And this line is not fixed for our case. It can move actually as per temperature and pressure. While the lower curve here is called equal equilibrium line, where we have seen its equation in the previous slide, y as a function of x with a very low slope passing through uh, zero. And uh, based on this, guys, or based on the distance between these two curves, Maccabi and Thiel actually came with a procedure to find the number of theoretical stages. How many theoretical stages are there? And then we can convert them to number of plates. If you look at this, how the number of theoretical stages are calculated or determined from this chart. So basically we have the bottom of the, uh, the, bottom of the column or the bottom of the absorber here and the top of the absorber here. You remember, Water content is larger where? At the bottom or at the top? Definitely at the bottom. And at the bottom here, what we're gonna get, we will get very high water content. While at the top, we have low water contents. Then uh, uh, these two uh, scientists came up with an idea, uh, actually drawing a line from the operating line that goes all the way down. Let's say this is at the exit, okay, at the bottom, sorry. So we intersect with the operating, drawing a line to intersect with the equal equilibrium. Then we go left to intersect with operating line. After that, we go down to intersect with, again, equal equilibrium. We go to the left, okay, and we intersect and then we go down and we intersect and we keep doing this. So each triangle in here represent a stage. Okay, so this is one stage. This is another stage. If we, again, if we enlarge it, we might have the third stage. But what is the limit for those stages eventually? It's the bottom and the top of the column water canted. Now let's say, if water contents at the top, let's say should be almost at this line, should be almost, let's say 13, okay? Then we have only one theoretical stage. Let's say if the water content at the exit is at, at, in the middle here, okay? Let's say 35, then we have half a stage, even we don't have one full theoretical stage. Let's see how can we do this in terms of example. So in this example, guys, you are asked to calculate the diameter and height for an absorption column for the dehydration of wet natural gas under uh, the given conditions. The first condition uh, is flow rate is equal to 98 million standard cubic feet per day. And the density of this wet gas is given to be 3.79 pound mass per feet cube. Uh, and this, guy, this gas is saturated with water at operating conditions, which is excellent. So the operating conditions of the columns are 1000 PSIG and 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And the target gas water content is seven pound per million standard cubic feet. And you remember in the last webinar, we said the sale gas water content should not exceed this value. So actually we went to the edge of uh, water content in, uh, uh, in the exiting gas from the column. And next what is said, 
we uh, it was stated that the triethylene glycol for uh, dehydration is not of let's say uh, 89 purity so the purity is 98.5 uh, uh, okay and which means that 1.5 is water so the glycol comes back with a little bit of water is almost one and a half percent and the density of this glycol is 70 pound per feet cube and there is a condition here no stripping gas is used because sometimes in the stripper they use some gas to accelerate the process of uh, water evaporation and this is what we need to do for this column we need to calculate the height of the column and we need to calculate the diameter. So first we need to calculate the diameter. Uh, as I said, we start with the uh, compressibility factor Z using any technique based on the given uh, data. For our case, we can go back and find the uh, uh, reduced properties for this gas without knowing its composition and we calculate Z factor to be almost 0.9, okay? After that, we calculate the volumetric flow rate of the gas using the real gas equation of state. And uh, we just plug the given numbers, okay? 98 uh, uh, eventually uh, million standard cubic feet. We divide it eventually by a number that accounts for number of moles, including the density and mass, etc. We multiply it by Z factor. We multiply it by real gas constant or gas constant without saying real. Okay, it applies to both real and ideal gas. We multiply it by the temperature, 100 plus 460. And then we divide it by the pressure, which is 1000 plus 14.7 to have it in PSI. And we obtain that the volumetric flow rate is eventually 953 feet cube per minute. And of course, in this number, again, it, it, we account for the conversion from days to minutes. Well, then we calculate the maximum uh, velocity, okay? And using the Sauda, uh, Sauda uh, Brown equations, and after plugging the number, we find the maximum velocity is equal to 46.5. 46.0 and then we divide the volumetric flow rate by maximum velocity and we obtain the area of the column or cross-sectional area of the column to be 20.7 feet square from which we can calculate the diameter of the column to be 5.1 foot which means the column is almost one and a half meter it's quite large column. Then we move to height, to calculate the height of the uh, column. So what do we have? Uh, uh, at the bottom of the column, eventually, uh, uh, we can find from the uh, Maccabi Thyle chart, we can find Y1, okay, which means the water uh, vapor contents, okay, in the gas which is 63 bound water per million standard cubic feet, okay? X1, actually, we can figure it out from the chart or we can calculate it from the material balance, okay? And it's always good to uh, double check it from the material balance for uh, this process or for this separation process. And as you know, uh, in this material balance, you know uh, Y and X, and basically V is the volumetric flow rate of the gas, which is given. And L is the uh, circulation or reflux, okay, of uh, uh, glycol into uh, the absorber, okay? Now, Y2 is given at the top of the column. So uh, water content in the gas is given, which is seven uh, bounds H2O per million standard cubic feet. And X2 can be, is given actually, it's given uh, uh, glycol is circulated with 98.5 purity, 
or you can see it from the figure as well. So this is basically uh, the beauty of using Maccabi thyl uh, uh, figure, okay? Now we need to calculate L. Uh, if we assume that as per the standard, uh, uh, two gallons of TEG are required per each pound of water, okay? Then what is the value of L? Then L can be calculated based on the gas flow rate and the difference between the mole fraction of uh, liquid phase or water, okay? multiplied by the number of needed gallons. So after plugging uh, basically the numbers, we determine that the circulation rate of glycol is 7.6 gallons per minute. So 7.6 gallons per minute for the process is not that large amount, uh, which is quite uh, good, okay? And after that, we use the material balance. Everything is known in the material balance. And just we need to calculate X1. And what we're going to see, we just carry out this uh, uh, small calculations, easy calculation, linear equations. And we find out that X1 is 94.7. Okay. X1, X1, we said is the weight percent of a glycol where at, if we go back, okay, in here. So we have eventually X2 and we have X1, X1 at the bottom, which means is the weight percent of TEG, okay, rich with water. So at the top is 98.5. Okay, which when it comes as lean glycol, it's of high purity. Okay, so it has only one and a half percent water. When it leaves the column from the bottom, X1, eventually it was determined to be 94.7, which means the water content in the rich glycol is 5.3 percent. So we need now to decrease this one by one and a half percent. So we are talking about 3.7% to be removed. Imagine the whole process, how many units we have just to decrease the uh, glycol water content by less than, let's say 5%. Lots of cost is there, but we don't have to forget the fact that glycol is expensive and we cannot dump it. We have to uh, uh, regenerate it and we have to use it again. After knowing these facts, guys, what we do, so basically from this figure, we see that uh, we have to have one and a half stage because seven actually is here. So we don't have a complete stage in this corner. So uh, the number of theoretical uh, stages is one and a half. We utilize this one with the 25% efficiency of each tray and the actual number of stages then is six. The distance between a stage and another or a tray and another is two feet. Then we multiply six by two and we get the height of the column to be 12 feet. Okay, and usually they add actually a margin for the top cover and the bottom cover of the, uh, uh, of the column. And it can be calculated using the previously shown equations, number of stages multiplied by spacing divided by the efficiency and we end up having a height of 12 feet for the column. So it's straightforward. But this is not the end. So some other calculations have to be done for the trays, for uh, their design, for their valves, caps, for uh, uh, mist extractors that goes at the uh, top and other issues. Then we move to uh, the second part of today's talk and uh, we will cover the only uh, theoretical uh, um, part or let's say um, physics of the process without touching pace with respect to design. 
uh, which is the utilization of solid bed uh, materials, okay, or solid bed in general for dehydration uh, process. And when we say solid bed, it means water is taken or water vapor is taken by solid particles. And the process itself is called adsorption. So previously we used to call it uh, water by solvent absorption and uh, water by solid adsorption. Uh, how does it work? It's quite simple. So basically the solid matter attracts water vapor or water molecules to the surface of the solid. So this picture is uh, enlarged significantly. And they basically stick with the surface or adhere to the surface and the process is called adhesion. And then as time goes in, another layer of water molecules gets deposited into the previously deposited layer. And the process continues until the layers of waters cannot carry itself. So water eventually sinks down to the other surface. And it's not as simple as that, guys. There are lots of explanation behind it uh, with respect to uh, mass transfer with respect to diffusion, but it is beyond uh, the scope of this lecture. So when to use this? Why don't we say, let's go with absorption. It's quite good. And uh, we regenerate uh, uh, our TEG and it's safe, seems to be safe, okay? Well, uh, now we have to think of uh, a dew point. If we need to go to a very low dew point, you remember in the previous case, we had a dew point of minus 10. Let's say if we wanna have a dew point of minus 50, then a glycol doesn't work, okay? We have to think of these physical processes. So this is the main driving force behind using uh, uh, absorption where water again is absorbed by solid uh, adsorbents, or we call them in oil industry desiccants. If you go to, uh, if you work in this field in the future, you will see they, they say uh, uh, desiccants for uh, dehydration processes. Different types exist, such as silica gel, activated alumina, and or molecular sieves. So one of them is uh, used and they are nothing but basically porous material and uh, they are uh, uh, mostly spherical in shape, uh, can be produced actually, or you could see some of them in a cylindrical uh, shape particles, but mostly uh, they are produced in spherical shape because it has the minimum surface area and all area is exposed to uniform adsorption process. They can actually impipe the same amount of fluid from all around. And the other reason of having them spherical, because after absorbing a large amount of water vapor, and when they become completely saturated with water vapor, we have to uh, dry them up which is called uh, reactivation. We have to activate them again, okay? So uh, th these are uh, basically the reasons behind using them with this shape. Now, when it comes to the properties of these uh, solid desiccants or adsorbents, so uh, we worry uh, a lot about their uh, design capacity, how much water uh, can they carry or can they absorb? So if they absorb large amount of water, then this is great. If you look at these three uh, desiccants, eventually silica gel absorption can go up to 20%, which is quite large compared to other two desiccants. Uh, another property guys, which is quite important is minimum dew point. Minimum dew point, it uh, goes to uh, minus 90 silica gel, activated alumina minus 90. Molecular sieve goes to minus 300, which basically gives molecular sieve 
more credit when it comes to a, a dew point compared to silica when it comes to a design capacity. Now, another factor to look at, guys, is bore diameter. And bore diameter is given in angstrom. One angstrom is equal to 10 to minus uh, 10 meter, which is 0.1 nanometer. Now, if you look at those, so eventually the size here is almost, uh, you could say one nanometer, one to nine nanometer, which is quite large size. Why do we have to worry about this? Because these solid particles eventually absorb water or water gets absorbed into the surface of the solid particle. What about if the pore diameter is larger than the uh, uh, molecular size of water. Now, if we think of the molecular size of water is 0.27 nanometer. Now, if we go up, what we said, the silica gel size is one nanometer, which is larger than the size or molecular size of water. What does this mean? This means that water does not only stick to the surface of this solid particle, but also diffuses or goes into the pore and adheres to the internal surface of the pore. And this results in increasing the capacity or design capacity of these solid desiccants. And this is basically the main reason of having uh, these particles with a uh, larger size compared to the molecular size of water molecules. Well, which one of those to select? This depends on the economics, depends on the cost. It's, they are a bit expensive. And uh, if you look, for example, at uh, uh, silica gel, one ton of silica gel costs up to 1,500 uh, um, eventually uh, dollars, okay? And we said this one, the design capacity is the most important property. Uh, they have one drawback, these desiccants. Actually, it was determined that their capacity goes down as the temperature goes up. Do we have a case where the temperature goes up in the process or in this treatment? Yes, and that's what we will see uh, next. So how does the process work? The process is quite simple. So uh, each column in here is called a bed, okay? Where these materials, these solid desiccants are stacked inside the beds or poured inside the beds. They are solid, not liquid, but we could say that or uploaded, okay, into the bed. And what you see in this picture, we have two beds. These two beds don't operate simultaneously at the same time. So if we have two beds, so one is operating and when the solid desiccants become completely saturated with water, we have to stop this bed and to uh, use the second uh, ideal or uh, not used bed, okay? And we sw switch the operation. What does this mean? This means that as a minimum, we have to have two beds available, okay? So there is no way guys to carry out absorption process with one bed. Why? Because the process will not be continuous. So if you carry the process, let's say for eight hours, then you have to stop it for eight hours for regeneration, which is uh, economically unvisible. So how many beds then we can have? Two or more. You could have three, you could have four, you could have five, you could have multi wells. This depends in the water content in the gas stream or produced gas and uh, treatment uh, requirements, okay? And this is seen, guys. O in here uh, stands for open, the valve is open, and C stands for uh, a closed valve. Now, how the process works, it works quite simple. We know that the water content in the incoming gas is large. Then when it hits the top part of the bed, uh, the first part to become highly saturated or reaches equilibrium in terms of saturation is the top part. 
while the parts below it is basically uh, working in the so-called mass transfer zone, which means still water is absorbed by the solid particles, while the lowest part, which is far away, is still active and basically available for adsorption. Nothing is absorbed there. As a function of time, this equal aprium and this mass transfer zone are propagating down there. So they keep moving, okay, down there, as we can see here. So throughout the column, uh, equal aprium and then mass transfer zone will move down, okay, until uh, equal aprium stage follows or pushes eventually the mass transfer. When the mass transfer zone reaches the exit, then this is a sign that we have to stop the process and to regenerate or deactivate. Okay, or activate actually. So uh, what's shown in the right-hand side here, we have actually three beds. As you can see, one bed is ideal and the other two bits are operating at different times. Well, the mass transfer zone location is basically a, a lagging, okay? Or there is a time lead, okay? Or time lag when it comes to the second one. Why do we have to do that? Because when this one becomes basically fully saturated, we stop this bit and we use the available bit for uh, activation, okay? Or desiccants activation. And then this one is uh, regenerated. And when this one reaches full saturation, eventually this one is used for uh, uh, processing and this one is regenerated. And this is what's seen here. So basically it explains the concentration of water in the inlet stream as a function of time. And that's what we have. So in the inlet stream, we have C sub O or concentration of water. In the outlet stream, as a function of time, the concentration initially is minimal. There is water vapor, but initially was zero when we started the process. But uh, after some time, even eventually some water vapor is there, but the amount is slow. And this will keep doing so as long as the mass transfer zone is away from the exit. And when the mass transfer zone approaches the exit of the bed, okay, we have a significant increase in the concentration of exiting stream. And this continues until we have basically the same concentration of water uh, entering the column and exiting the column. And when we monitor this, this stage basically indicates the requirements for uh, uh, activation of the uh, solid desiccant. And this time, if we go down, this time is called actually water breakthrough time, okay? And this is what we need to design or we can calculate by uh, design. So uh, this is beyond the scope of today's talk we will uh, uh, not uh, eventually cover it. Now, when um, these desiccants are fully saturated with water, we have to regenerate them. And the regeneration process is quite simple. Just now, instead of having this valve, let's say this one is fully saturated, uh, we close this valve and we close this valve. Okay, so gas basically is not flowing in and out anymore. And we open actually this valve and we open this valve. So the gas now will go to the second bed and will flow out through the second bed while this bed is regenerated. So hot gas initially is injected. So we open this and injected into the bed. And as a function of time, this hot gas eventually leaves from the top. We inject hot gas for almost six hours as per the practice dictation. And then we need to cool the bed down to uh, operating conditions. So basically after six hours, cold gas in, is injected to cool the bed down. And this basically shown in a much better way in these two beds. 
So adsorption process, basically it goes into the opposite direction of a mass transfer zone propagation, while the uh, activation process or regeneration process eventually is done in the opposite direction where the hot gas is injected from uh, the bottom as a function of time. And what we see in this figure, we see nothing but the temperature profiles for the uh, two inlet parts, inlet and outlet, I mean. So if we look at this one, this is temperature versus time. So at time zero, when the hot gas is injected, it takes basically maybe an hour or so to reach a, a T sub I. And eventually it keeps at the same constant temperature at the inlet of the bed, inside the bed. And after six hours, we switch between hot and cold gas. And uh, during this time, what happens to the temperature at the outlet? So eventually during these six hours, the temperature at the outlet eventually increasing, but does not reach exactly the same value of the inlet because this requires extra time. If we're gonna go, we need just to have our system uh, in uh, activation or regeneration mode for a longer time, which is not required as basically per the practice. So, uh, after six hours, the inlet temperature basically uh, 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 is not hot anymore. We switch to cold. And what happens to the outlet temperature? Again, it follows the inlet and it reaches almost atmospheric temperature, okay, after eight hours. And this is what we mean. Each bed requires almost eight hours for operation purposes. And this is design uh, concepts and uh, followed by different industry. So as a wrap up, uh, what we cover today, we cover the three outcomes. Now, basically you uh, can understand what we have been talking about. So a glycol uh, dehydration process by absorption. And we had seen an example or design example to calculate the diameter of the height or diameter and the height of the uh, uh, absorber. And the second one, we did talk about solid bed uh, dehydration or uh, physical process. How does it take place? I want to stop it here. I have no more slides to uh, show. And these are the references that, uh, I refer to. Uh, just you can uh, gain more info if you need. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, doctor, for the great webinar. Yeah. Uh, we shall now address the questions. So first question, which type of molecular sieve is recommended for air dehydration? Well, uh, actually, uh, uh, zeolite, zeolite based uh, is the best. It was determined that uh, adsorption by zeolite is uh, quite high. And uh, in here, uh, it depends on the manufacturer. Um, as I stated or explained, not only the surface is important, but also the pore throats or the pore diameter is important as well. And you could find in the market many of them uh, available. And uh, there is lots of competitions uh, for the sake of sale. Okay, but when it comes to application, eventually zeolite uh, is really good. Mm, okay, and uh, the last question, to decrease the dew point lower of a gas, it means to decrease the water content in the gas? Well, uh, you've seen this actually, uh, yes, it's true. Uh, if you remember the equation where we talk about the equal equilibrium constant, which is equal to yi divides by um, uh, xi, or equal to partial pressure uh, divides by total pressure. So if we decrease the vapor pressure of water in the gas, then we can shift the equilibrium uh, down. Shifting the equilibrium down is exactly similar to uh, decreasing the dew point. 
Uh, I seen guys last time, and today you ask about the same concepts. It seems do point it creates some problems for you. And I love to uh, explain this always with respect to humidity, because this is the easiest way to understand it. So uh, what we have all around us is gas. We have air, right? And now we have uh, atmospheric uh, pressure and atmospheric temperature. So where the pressure eventually is constant. What does change is temperature. As temperature changes, eventually, let's say if temperature is uh, in the morning is cold. So evaporation of water from the seas, from wherever it is, is almost low. So which means uh, very few molecules of water can evaporate, let's say, uh, during the first day, uh, half of the day. Now, uh, during the midday, rate of evaporation is high. We get more, uh, basically, water uh, 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 evaporation. And later on, basically, rate of evaporation or the same number of molecules are going up and going down. So if one molecule is going up and there is one molecule of water is going down. And this is called equal equilibrium. When we reach this stage, guys, when the same numbers are going up and down, eventually we talk about the dew point. And this is the dew. We need to shift this one down. And shifting this down eventually has a cost. Okay. okay. Any other question? Uh, that's it for the questions today. Okay. Thank you very much again for your time. If you allow me, actually, Roma, I got two other questions, okay? The other yes, one related to uh, glycol recovery. Okay, I see okay. a question about the glycol recovery. Can we uh, uh, enhance it more than, let's say, 98.9%? Uh, okay. Uh, well, uh, it can be. It can be uh, using vacuum technology, but the cost will go up. So we need to worry about the visibility of the uh, process and to uh, not to go to extreme. Uh, having water coming back does not create any problems because anyway, glycol will take water away. And this is again, if you remember in the example, the inlet water, it was about 63 pounds per uh, million, pounds of water per million standard cubic feet. And the exit is seven. So the difference is almost uh, 56 pounds, okay? So we have to get rid of 60, 56 pounds, which stands for less than 5%, okay? So uh, we, we should take care of all these uh, uh, parameters. There should be a balance between cost and uh, operation. And the other question is uh, related to number of stages. We said it, number of stages is between uh, six and Okay, I have no more questions listed here. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you again. And that's it for today. I would like to remind you all to that this session is being recorded and it will be posted on Piper to YouTube channel. Stay tuned for the other upcoming webinars by following Arab Oil and Gas Academy Facebook page. And we wish you all the best of luck. Goodbye. Till next time. Goodbye. Okay.